Welcome to today's Facebook Live. We begin with a stark number this afternoon. According to the Centers for Disease Control, people make 139 million visits to the emergency department every year. <clears throat> However, due to the COVID uh, pandemic, these visits are down considerably here in Michigan and across the country. On average, ER visits are down by 50% or more compared to the same time last year. This leads us to today's topic, the emergency department and why you should not delay care during the pandemic. Welcome to this edition of Facebook Live. I'm David Olajars, Media Relations Manager, Henry Ford Health System. For our discussion, I'm pleased to introduce three Henry Ford doctors who are experts in their field. Dr. John Delata, Chair of Emergency Medicine. Dr. Akshay Kandelwal, Associate Division Head of Cardiology at Henry Ford Hospital. And Dr. Alex Shibul, Director of Henry Ford Stroke Center. Welcome to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Before I get started, a couple of quick reminders for those who are watching and who may be new to our Facebook Live events. Make sure to turn on your sound. And also, you can read the disclaimer at the top of this thread. With that, we're going to get rolling here. Dr. Delat, I'd like to begin with you. Henry Ford has nine emergency departments here in, in the metro Detroit area, as well as one in Jackson, all of which we know are very busy, very robust throughout the year. What do you make of this downturn in visits the last few months? Thank you, Dave. Well, the downturn in visits uh, was somewhat predictable, uh, given uh, our state's executive order on stay home and stay safe. This has resulted, at the same time, uh, we also know that uh, there was quite a bit of messaging uh, in the public sector uh, towards the beginning of our crisis that uh, seeking emergency care uh, should be uh, done so uh, selectively and in a way that uh, was really based upon uh, severity of symptoms at that time of our crisis. Um, however, uh, over time, uh, what we've experienced is uh, a downturn in those visits. Again, like I said, expected secondary to our stay home, stay safe order. Uh, but at this point, um, we feel as though uh, that has lagged quite a bit in regards to where we predicted it. We did not predict for uh, this level of uh, decrease in visits to persist uh, this long. And at this point, uh, we, we, we are concerned in regards to it. Dr. Kandlewall, uh people's anxiety and stress levels obviously are up, you know, currently. People aren't exercising, exercising as much as, as they're used to due to the stay-at-home orders all of which, of course, contribute to a person's well-being. From a cardiology standpoint, are you concerned that people who might have signs of a heart condition, um, which could be life-threatening, of course, and they may be avoiding the ER? I think that's a valid concern. Uh, globally, we've seen about a 25 to 40% drop uh, in heart attacks presenting to emergency rooms. That's based on anecdotal information, talking to colleagues across the world, uh, polls that have been conducted, as well as some papers that have been expeditedly published. Uh, and, and this is something that's attracted the attention of my professional society, the American College of Cardiology, and the European Society of Cardiology, as well as many other worldwide uh, cardiac bodies. Um, now, it may be due to a true drop in incidents. I mean, despite the financial stress and your issues that you raised uh, regarding some well-being challenges, maybe this sort of return to 19th century style living uh, is actually better for us, right? So we don't have to worry about traffic. There's less pollution. We're not eating out. We're probably eating more food that's uh, cooked at home, um, maybe even more exposure to outdoors, even though we're not utilizing gyms. However, our fear is, is that people aren't seeking the care that they need when they're having heart attack symptoms. Uh, and there is some early evidence for that, so that we, when we have had people that are presented with heart attacks, many times they have admitted that they've delayed care or that they were concerned about uh, COVID-19. Uh, there have been several cases that have been reported both 
uh, within our health system as well as other health systems that uh, people have ended up with complications from heart attacks that we haven't seen in or haven't seen with um, uh, with as much prevalence uh, as before uh, because they're staying at home and, and running into complications from their heart attack. Uh, and the true measure might be in the months to years to come when people who have survived their heart attacks that they suffered at home end up presenting with heart failure and, uh, and other uh, worsening cardiac conditions. Um, so I think it's a mixed bag. Dr. Shabul, as an expert in, in, in treating stroke, uh, what concerns you most about the situation right now in the emergency department? Um, we are seeing, seeing a similar reduction in the numbers of patients with stroke presenting to the emergency department. Um, and we know that the COVID-19 virus is not a cure for stroke and cardiovascular disease, so it must be that patients are staying home and they're not coming to the hospital. Um, and in fact, we know that there is a, some increased risk of stroke and uh, cardiovascular events in patients who have COVID-19 as well as many other uh, infections. And so we're very concerned that some patients are not coming to the hospital. Uh, probably there are patients who have minor strokes or TIAs, which are warning strokes, um, for which they should be seeking um, uh, care. Um, we are seeing uh, the major strokes uh, presenting to the hospital um, and some uh, particular types of stroke we're seeing more often than expected. Um, and there's ongoing research to look at why this is happening um, and how best to treat uh, those patients. But um, uh, we're very concerned about this and we want people to come back uh, to seek uh, care. Stroke in particular, unlike heart attack, because it's often not associated with pain, it's been a challenge over the decades to convince people to come to the hospital. And, and our biggest concern is that this is going to scare people uh, even uh, to make them even less likely to come when they have a stroke. Dr. Delato, we know the emergency department has been sort of the entry point, if you will, for COVID patients being admitted to the hospital. Now that we're seeing sort of a plateau of these cases, um, how can you reassure the public uh, in terms of safety precautions are being taken at the emergency department to sort of, you know, help people with their with their anxiety and with their with their fear? Good question, David. Well, I can tell you that all safety and precautionary measures that we uh, began uh, during the initial lead up to uh, the surge of COVID nineteen patients that we've maintained all of those same precautions and will be maintaining all of those same precautions going forward. Our expectation is that COVID-19 will still be something in our community that we have to manage and be prepared for long-term. So uh, at the same time, uh, all of our staff members uh, are uh, rigidly adhering to personal protective equipment uh, regulations and uh, recommendations. At the same time, we have uh, rigid and CDC recommended employee health uh, recommendations that we follow in regards to maintaining the safety of our staff. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, staff members that, um, that may have previously been exposed, we go through rigorous processes to ensure their safety and, uh, and that they are not a source uh, of uh, COVID-19 uh, in a patient's care. Further, uh, rigid hand hygiene uh, precautions are always in place. Uh, we practice social distancing. And at the same time, all members of our team, uh, be it uh, staff members, be it visitors, be it patients, are all screened prior to entering our facilities. So anybody who has symptoms or a fever upon presentation to our facilities uh, they are uh, referred for uh, medical attention at that time and are not actively participating in any uh, patient care or other activities within our facilities. Has the, has the triage process changed any in the ER? Another great question. That's where I was going to go next is, is our triage process involves uh, an upfront screen, if you will. As, as you enter the proximal point of entry uh, into the emergency department, that's where your initial screening process begins. Uh, temperatures are taken and questions are asked in regards to symptoms at that time. Um, if you are presenting as a patient for care, 
and you display at any time at that front uh, screening process that you may have any symptoms or signs consistent with COVID-19, we split the flow of those patients into our emergency department such that uh, any patients that are symptomatic are treated in one area of the emergency department and those that are not symptomatic of COVID-19 or are not visiting our emergency department secondary to any concerns for COVID-19, we treat them in a, in a, in a second uh, area of our emergency department. So effectively, we have a split flow process uh, where COVID-19 and non-COVID-19 complaints uh, are managed uh, in entirety. Should, are, are, are patients who, who, do patients who come to the ER, should they expect to, to be given a mask upon entry? Yes. Whether, whether you're a child or, or even an adult? Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, that is the case. And uh, if patients uh, present without a mask, we obviously provide that for them. But at the same time, we, we certainly honor uh, patients uh, presenting with their own personal protective equipment, uh, assuming that it meets the, the appropriate standards for, for use. And can you talk a little bit about um, uh, some of the misinformation that's been out there in the public domain about the role of the emergency department? Um, in the fact that by federal law, an emergency department cannot refuse care to a person, correct? That's correct. Um, that is correct. The, the emergency management, emergency medical treatment and labor act, uh, that is a federal law, uh, requires all hospitals with, uh, verified emergency departments to, uh, provide care to any person that seeks, uh, medical attention at their facility and that involves providing a medical screening evaluation. Uh, we provide uh, that standard uh, at our front door uh, and continue to do so, and that, that has long been in place. Um, the, the misinformation um, is, is a complex matter. If you rewind the clock 20 years, uh, use of emergency departments uh, were, were definitely geared towards uh, individuals who truly thought they were, uh, you know, there was a true threat to life and limb. However, over the past 20 years, as uh, lack of medical insurance has, has plagued certain uh, parts of America, as social determinants of health have become more and more uh, prominent in certain areas of our country, the emergency departments have become an access to care and, and, a, and a portal of entry to the necessary health care that a community member may need. And so the emergency departments have certainly developed themselves in a way to be able to provide care regardless of how intense or how minor that care might be necessary to treat and meet the expectations of a patient who feels as though they have a medical emergency. The most recent developments uh, in as far as the last two months are concerned with COVID-19, again, we had a, a kind of a conventional wisdom messaging in our communities across our country that uh, patients shouldn't seek attention at hospitals unless they were critically ill. And, and I do feel as though we are suffering in certain ways from that messaging at this point, because that was a very brief period of time where perhaps that might have been accurate and it is no longer uh, in play at this time. At the start of the pandemic, uh, Henry Ford hospitals, as well as other hospitals across the country, did put into practice, um, you know, visitor policies. Is that visitor policy still in play at the Henry Ford hospitals? Um, and, and, and can somebody come visit or be accompanied by um, a loved one when coming to the emergency department? Yes, uh, thank you for that question, David. Um, we do allow one visitor uh, with patients uh, who are seeking uh, medical attention in our emergency department, uh, assuming they are not symptomatic or, or potentially screen positive at, 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 our, at our screening process and coming into the emergency department. So uh, patients who are, are, are seeking care uh, for non-COVID reasons, uh, are permitted to bring, uh, have one visitor or family member with them. Uh, in situations where uh, patients are being cared for uh, for COVID-19, we restrict visitors and family members 
simply for their own safety. Uh, however, depending upon the critical nature of the illness at any given time, uh, we have case-by-case -case considerations for visitors for those, for those uh, patients. And for those who may say, you know, gee, I, I don't want to go to the emergency department um, and, and sort of get in the way of, of personnel taking care of COVID patients, you would say what? Well, I would say that uh, family members and visitors participate in patient care. Uh, as part of a, a network of, of support and as loved ones of, of, of our patients. Again, our policy for patients who are being treated for COVID is we, we limit visitors in that situation, but um, a family member or a visitor with a, for a patient that does not have COVID-19 symptoms, uh, I feel is a requisite part of the care team, to be honest. May is High Blood Pressure Awareness Month as well as Stroke Awareness Month. Dr. Kaldewal, could you talk about how high blood pressure and, and it's, what's it, so its association with uh, heart disease? Sure, uh, and uh, perhaps Dr. Chubble can also talk about the relationship of high blood pressure and stroke. But high, high blood pressure untreated can cause the heart muscle to uh, thicken abnormally, uh, and then over time the heart can dilate and both can, can uh, cause a condition known as heart failure. Uh, certainly if you have a heart failure, you have worsening symptoms of shortness of breath, uh, swelling in your legs, you can't breathe at night, for example, and uh, sometimes it can become pretty severe to where you can't get enough oxygen into your blood or your blood pressure is, is, is elevated too high to be brought down safely at home, causing other symptoms. Uh, in those cases, uh, we recommend that patients seek urgent or emergent care. Dr. Shibla, you want to pick up on that thought as it relates to uh, neurological conditions? Uh, yes, so stroke and cardiovascular disease are very related. And what they share in common is their association with high blood pressure, which is not only the number one cause of stroke, but the number one most treatable cause of stroke and heart disease. Um, and really, uh, high Hypertension is, is, is the most important disease known to mankind because uh, it's associated with stroke and heart attack, which are the number one, number two killers worldwide. And in the United States, uh, stroke is the number five uh, killer. Um, and the, the good news is that hypertension is treatable. And if it is causing a stroke, we also now treat strokes. And people can literally come to the hospital paralyzed with severe stroke symptoms and can walk home a few days later. Um, so... Uh, this is uh, May, uh, Stroke Awareness Month. Um, people should become familiar with the signs and symptoms of stroke. And if they or a loved one or anyone they know has a stroke, they should seek immediate medical attention and call 911. Dr. Kaldewal, we know that uh, minutes count as it relates to a heart attack. And so why is it important for someone to call 911 if they are experiencing signs of of a heart attack. I think it's precisely what you said. Uh, we've embraced this concept that time is muscle and that for every minute, every second uh, that you have symptoms, that means that artery is blocked and heart muscle is uh, irreversibly dying. Uh, dying heart muscle, the larger the amount of heart muscle that dies, the more risk you are of having uh, heart failure, uh, as I kind of described earlier with, uh, in relation to blood pressure. Uh, the more at risk you are of having complications from heart attacks, uh, whether it's um, mechanical problems, uh, tears in the valve, tears in the wall of the heart, or even down the line, arrhythmias, irregular heart rhythms that can cause sudden cardiac arrest. Um, and, and so it's very, very important that people recognize the symptoms of a heart attack and, and seek timely care. Can you talk about those symptoms and how they're different for both men and women? Sure. Uh, the typical or classic uh, heart attack uh, symptom pattern is uh, chest pain or chest pressure in the center of the chest, uh, often moving or radiating or traveling into your left arm, uh, often the inside of the left arm, uh, into the left neck and left jaw. Uh, there are other uh, associated symptoms that stand alone can serve as what we call atypical symptoms. So that can be, for example, uh, shortness of breath, uh, nausea, vomiting, uh, isolated jaw, pain, or even a, a, a very, very bad, unusual toothache, um, profuse sweatiness, um, 
you know, cold, clammy skin. Um, uh, also, irregular heartbeats, nearly passing out, passing out. All, all of those without the chest pain could still be signs of a heart attack. And those atypical symptoms that I just mentioned uh, have a higher prevalence in women, uh, in elderly, and in diabetics. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, those are some of the same groups that also have an increased incidence of, of, of COVID as well. So it's important to recognize that uh, your symptoms, um, you won't be able to diagnose your symptoms. You, you may be in a high risk cohort either way. And it really takes medical experts to be able to differentiate. I think uh, that's where we've seen people run into trouble where they try and rationalize whether it's, it's just really, really bad reflux, the worst reflux they've had, or just a really bad bio illness or something else when in fact it truly is a heart attack and heart muscle is dying. And, and talking about uh, how minutes count, there's something in medical parlance called the, the door to the balloon time. Mm -hmm. What is that and, and why is that so important? Yeah, I think uh, it, it recognizes that, um, that uh, again, it's the concept of seconds count, minutes count, and uh, for every, every uh, little bit of delay in trying to reopen the blocked artery, there are consequences to that. Uh, and the Door to Balloon Initiative was something that cardiologists came up with, I think, um, several years ago to try and solve this problem of uh, reducing the complications of a heart attack, reducing the size of a heart attack, uh, and, and improving more um, um, survival rates from heart attack. I think what we've really done, though, now at this point is we really embraced a total team approach and I've heard other ER doctors, for example, refer it to as a relay race. Uh, and there are four parts to that relay race. There's the patient, uh, there's the emergency medical system, there's the emergency physician, and then there's the cardiologist or the interventional cardiologist. And all four are critical parts of that relay race. If one person sort of drops the baton, uh, then the whole process fails. Um, and uh, we've moved not just to a door to balloon time goal of 90 minutes, which we were very successful at achieving at, at Henry Ford Hospital, but we've actually moved towards an emergency, uh, our first medical contact to balloon time, which really in, involves uh, either EMS or the emergency room doctor and recognizes that it's a team approach. Uh, our goal is to shorten that to um, 90 minutes or less. And if you add the patient component, we really want this uh, onset of symptoms to opening up the artery to be in two hours. So if you think about that, that relay race is so critical that time interval is actually relatively short. Sometimes, unfortunately, people wait up to one or two hours to even start to think about calling 911. And so once again, I think it highlights the role that the emergency medical system and then the emergency room can play in expediting that care and saving lives. And, and talk, talk a little bit also about the, the network of, of cardiovascular services that we provide across the health system. Yeah, I think uh, you can get expert care at any one of our um, uh, uh, hospitals, as well as our standalone emergency rooms. We're very well integrated to ensure that um, uh, even if there's not a cardiologist on site, one is immediately available by phone. And we're prepared, uh, no matter which location that you present to uh, or that EMS takes you to, uh, to provide that high level of care uh, throughout our Henry Ford Health System. This question uh, comes from Sue, uh, Dr. Candlewall. Are you able to give blood if you're on blood thinners? Um, follow the, it depends on, on the type of blood thinners. I think in, in general, uh, they'll suggest that you don't uh, donate blood. Uh, the reason is, is that because some of those blood thinners can inhibit the way blood functions, uh, but speak to your um, uh, medical doctor or uh, to a donation center to see what's right for you, depending on what, what types of blood thinners you may or may not be on. Dr. Shabul, uh, Certainly with, with uh, stroke care, men is count just as well. They're just as important. Can you talk about uh, the signs of a stroke and what people should be looking out for? And, and remind us about the acronym FAST and what those letters stand for. Certainly, thank you for the question. So FAST stands for face, meaning any paralysis or drooping of the face. Arm, uh, a weakness or paralysis of the arm, unable to move an arm. Um, and then S is for speech, slurring of speech or mixing up words. And T is just to remind you that time is of the essence. So if you or a loved one has any sudden paralysis, um, difficulty speaking, um, uh, call 911. Now, those are the most common symptoms of stroke and they're most common symptoms of a major stroke, but there are other more subtle signs of stroke, such as vision loss, 
sudden inability to walk um, or sudden severe headache, sudden confusion. Um, and people who have developed those symptoms should also uh, call 911 and seek immediate medical attention. And if I may add, uh, just to go back to what was said about a heart attack uh, and uh, you know, time is brain, just like it's time is myocardium. Um, and we have the same uh, goals um, as the cardiologists, get the artery open as soon as possible. And we have similar processes um, where we try to identify patients. The emergency department is the major uh, place where the identification of a stroke occurs. Um, so that the patients can then be triaged for some of the newer therapies like pulling clots out of the brain um, uh, that can really uh, cure patients. This question uh, comes in from Janelle. Are the symptoms for stroke any different for a man or a woman? Uh, generally not. And, and can you talk about what happens to the body during a stroke, Dr. Shibble? So. A stroke is what happens when there's brain damage due to a blockage of a brain artery or vein or a rupture of a brain artery. Uh, so the brain cells are dying. The body itself generally is okay. But since our brain controls all bodily functions, um, uh, patients with stroke tend to be disabled. And so brain cells are dying. And unfortunately, we cannot regrow brain cells once we become adults. And so limiting the amount of damage is the best way possible to prevent disability and return to normal function. Henry Ford um, has a number of stroke certifications at, at, uh, at our hospitals. What does that mean to the general public? Okay, so stroke certification is a way that the lay public, the consumer, the patient uh, can be certain that the facility that they're presenting to is able to offer the minimal or even the exceptional standard of care. So a primary stroke center means a hospital can give a clot busting medication by vein and not only can they give it, but they're able to do it consistently, quickly and safely. Then you have the next level up, which is a thrombectomy capable center, which are centers that are able to perform emergency procedures to remove blood clots from the brain 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And then the highest level is a comprehensive stroke center, which is really able to offer the full gamut of neurological care from neurosurgical care, neuro ICU, as well as all of those other stroke treatments that I discussed. And all of the Henry Ford hospitals are primary stroke centers. We have one thrombectomy capable center and Henry Ford Hospital is a comprehensive stroke center and it acts as the hub, um, uh, the, the, the central location where patients with the most complex uh, stroke disease, uh, strokes that present to the health system um, are referred to. Can you talk about the medical advances that have occurred over the years for treating uh, stroke? Certainly, 1995 was really the first major advance in the treatment of acute stroke. I wanna go back and say that really the major advance is the treatment of hypertension. I keep coming back to hypertension, but it's such an important disease and cause of stroke. So treating blood pressure is the number one cause, uh, number one thing to do. But if you're having an acute stroke, um, we can give a clot busting medication by vein, which breaks up the blood clot. But the really uh, major advance um, uh, was in 2015 when several devices were proven effective at removing the clots from the brain. This is similar to what the cardiologists do. They go through the, go through the groin, and we're able to put these devices inside the brain arteries and remove the clots. And these procedures are amongst the most effective treatments in the history of all medicine and really greatly improve the probability of recovering to normal or nearly normal. And then of course, we certainly don't want people delaying care when they're experiencing stroke symptoms, right? Absolutely. So time is brain. Um, uh, there, it's estimated that approximately 1.7 million, that's a million with an M, brain cells die every minute of a stroke. And um, it's hard to conceptualize what that means, um, but roughly for every one minute delay, the average patient loses 10 days of disability-free survival. So that means if you delay treatment for one hour, the average patient will lose 600 days of disability-free survival. That's devastating. Um, and so time is of the essence. 
fortunately, um, we're now able to treat patients later and later, but there's no way for any individual patient to know whether they can be uh, treated at five hours or they have to be treated within 30 minutes. And so the key is to seek immediate medical attention. So as I'm uh, sitting at home, um, you know, the sun is shining, weather is supposed to be breaking, hopefully, right? <laughs> Uh, more people are going outside, and hopefully they're honoring social distancing and wearing a mask and, and doing all those sorts of things, right? Um, Dr. Delata, what should people know about when, when, and when to go to the emergency department and when to go to like urgent care? What are the differences between those two? Sure. The differences between an urgent care and a hospital-based emergency department are, are largely uh, centered around capabilities uh, and the ability to manage the full array uh, and acuities of illnesses. And urgent care is, is, is more set up for uh, things like bumps, bruises, sprains, small lacerations, whereas emergency departments, especially those at level one trauma facilities or academic medical centers are more geared towards managing the most acute illnesses, the most intense or severe traumas, uh, or uh, things like we've talked about today, uh, myocardial infarction or heart attacks uh, or strokes. Um, at the same time, uh, severity uh, or severe uh, symptoms of diabetic emergencies, uh, severe abdominal pain that can be indicators of uh, of, of surgical problems or, or, or abdominal catastrophes. Those types of things are, where, are what emergency departments are built for and managed for. Dr. Kandawal, uh, besides uh, chest pain or, or heart attacks, what types of heart conditions should people not delay going to the emergency department for? Sure, so we talked about heart attacks as either typical or atypical symptoms that you have at rest. Sometimes you can have those typical or atypical symptoms uh, and it may not occur at rest, but it, it has what we call an accelerating pattern to where you know, a week ago it occurred walk, you know, while walking a block. Uh, yesterday it occurred climbing a flight of stairs. Today it occurs when you get up uh, to go get a bowl of fruit or something out of your fridge. If, if the pattern of symptoms seems to be accelerating like that, that can be a, a significant warning sign of an impending heart attack. Um, and that can often be diagnosed or at least treated or prevented um, uh, by going to the emergency room. Uh, worsening heart failure symptoms. So worsening shortness of breath to the point that you feel like you can't catch your breath at rest or that you're having extreme difficulty sleeping at night that is clearly worsening. Um, worsening short, uh, swelling of your legs, uh, again, all indicate worsening heart failure symptoms. Uh, passing out or nearly passing out may suggest an underlying electrical or arrhythmia problem, uh, arrhythmic problem regarding uh, and related to your heart. If you're on blood thinners, uh, medications like aspirin, Plavix, uh, Coumadin, um, Cerveza, Eliquis, other uh, blood thinner medications, and uh, you are suffering from significant obvious bleeding uh, or feeling extremely lightheaded or are passing out, again, that may be an indication to go uh, to the emergency room. Uh, people who are transplant recipients, cardiac transplant recipients, have often uh, received strict instructions as to when to call in and when to come into the emergency room, so they're usually aware of that. Um, and then overall, I think when, you know, when, when patients have that sense of impending doom, when, when it's the worst symptom that they've experienced, when it's the worst um, uh, and clearly different symptom that they've ever experienced before. So again, I went back to that atypical symptom of uh, epigastric pain or burning that, yes, I have some GERD, but gosh, this feels a lot worse than it normally does and it feels different and it makes me worried. That may easily be a sign of uh, something more serious. And Dr. Shabul, uh, what are some other neurological uh, emergencies that people ought to be mindful of? Uh, the number one would probably be trauma, head trauma, you know, a fall, a trip with severe headache, uh, that, 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 that's worsening. Um, uh, seizures uh, can uh, also uh, lead to significant uh, uh, complications, um, but infections of the nervous system, meningitis, um, and with the COVID-19 in particular and all infectious um, illnesses, um, the viruses can alter the immune system and it can actually attack our nerves and muscles. So people can develop paralysis 
um, uh, and that can manifest with difficulty breathing, difficulty swallowing. All of those are neurological emergencies and, and uh, patients should uh, seek medical attention for. And this is a question both for Dr. Candlewall and Dr. Chabot, uh, and it comes from Emily. Um, can, can patients come and see you, see each of you in clinic today? Or, or, are, are, or are some of your visits being uh, done virtually? I'm happy to start. Um, we have, um, our, our practice has done, I think, an exemplary job in, in allowing for both telephone calls and virtual visits. And, uh, and, and many times you don't necessarily have to be in the office to take care of some initial problems or, or titrate your medications, for example, for some well checks and things like that. So there's a lot that we can handle on, on the telephone or virtually. Um, however, uh, um, if there is an urgent need, for example, for a face-to-face -face visit, and there may be cardiac conditions where, for example, if you've just had a procedure or surgery and you think or we think that you're having complications that require a visit um, in the hospital or in clinic, we do have ways to bring you in safely to ensure that you're protected, to ensure that we're protected, uh, and, still seek, uh, and, still, and still provide you the care that you seek. Dr. Chabot? Yeah, similarly, uh, most of our visits currently are via telephone or preferably video because the neurological patient is very important to be able to perform a neurological examination. And we've actually become rather adept at performing many parts of the neurological examination. We can really tell if patients have uh, difficulties. Um, and so uh, for the foreseeable, well, I shouldn't say for the foreseeable future, for a short while longer, uh, we plan to try to see patients mostly virtually. Uh, but if there is a significant neurological deficit, probably, even if I was able to see you in clinic, I would ask you to go to the emergency department because um, many neurological conditions require urgent uh, brain scanning. Um, and those are very difficult to do in, in the office. And so most things we can really handle virtually. Um, other things require emergency department visit, but uh, hopefully soon we'll be able to return to seeing patients uh, in person. So we're, uh, we're heading into the, uh, the, the end of our discussion here. So I'd like to ask each of you for some, uh, for some closing remarks. Um, first, beginning with Dr. Delata. Thank you, David. Um, my closing remarks would center around the safety of our facilities. We've maintained the utmost precautions in managing and maintaining the safety of our patients that have sought care in our emergency departments. That's been through standardization and uh, the use of personal protective equipment, the use of universal mask policies on all staff, patients, visitors, um, intense adherence to hand hygiene policies, and really our efforts to split the flow of patients through our departments uh, and, um, and cohort the care of our patients um, with a, an obvious uh, precautionary measure towards uh, the spread and the treatment of COVID-19. So if there's, if there's one message that I can uh, provide is that the Henry Ford Health System emergency departments are safe places. Uh, they've always been safe places and they continue to be at this point. Um, and you should expect the same quality care that you've always depended upon uh, in seeking care within our emergency departments within the Henry Ford Health System. And for those who, uh, who, who are looking for locations of our ERs, you know, feel free to go to henryford.com backslash ER. Dr. Candlewall, please. Sure. Uh, data that I saw uh, through the second week of April still had heart disease as the number one killer even ahead of COVID. So it's important to recognize that uh, heart disease still plays an integral part, has played and will play an integral part um, of our lives and uh, many of the diagnoses of cardiac emergencies can only be made through the emergency room. Um, on, on a personal note, I, I would just mention that I have a young family and if I did not feel absolutely safe seeing patients in consultation in the emergency room, doing procedures in the cath lab, seeing patients in the uh, ICUs and on the floors and in clinic, um, I, I would be very concerned. Uh, I, and I have no such uh, qualms at all about serving patients because I know uh, and, uh, and trust that Henry Ford is an extremely safe place for those that really need the care uh, that they deserve. And Dr. Chabot. 
Yes, so I want to second uh, what's uh, been uh, said uh, and, and really point out something that may be obvious uh, or maybe it isn't so obvious is that personal protective equipment works both ways. It protects us and it protects you. Uh, we don't want to be infected. We don't want to infect you and we don't want to infect our loved ones. And so uh, you know, there's a tremendous effort at all stages of care from the emergency department. And if you get admitted with a stroke, um, and you have a, a you need special intensive care unit uh, care. We're putting patients who have COVID in units that have COVID patients, and those who don't have COVID, they're in non-COVID patients. And so, um, even during our procedure uh, for doing these procedures, we're utilizing special rooms that are designed for patients who have COVID um, and patients who do not. So we're taking every precaution possible to make sure that patients get the best care regardless of what they present with. And so um, I, I would not hesitate, especially if you're having a heart attack or stroke, please call 911. I want to thank uh, each of you for your expertise and your guidance today. Um, thank you very much. Um, we also want to thank those who've been watching uh, on Facebook and for your uh, great questions. For more information about emergency care, heart disease, or stroke care, go to henryford.com. And finally, before we go, please stay safe and healthy out there. And don't forget Sunday's Mother's Day. So happy Mother's Day to all the moms. You do, we appreciate everything you do, moms. And we'll see you next time on another edition of Facebook Live. Have a good afternoon. It's also Nurses Week. Thank you to all of our nurses. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.